Welcome back and we have Lillian Grace with us today. All right, getting back to a quest for riches. Um, so um, I, I'm already thrilled to read, uh, go through the entire thing, but uh, just for the sake of viewers, let's let's understand uh, what, what are these four uh, personality types you're talking about? Uh, yes, the, uh, of financial. course. Now, can I hold up the book sure, go to ahead. the camera? And there's the camera <laughs> there, this one. Right there. All right, right. good. Yeah. So this one, this one is the right one. Okay, so because uh, I'll point to them as we go. So this first character here is Tony. And you see she's pointing ahead like this. Tony is quite a leader type of a character and she's an entrepreneur, all right? So an entrepreneurial character is kind of, um, they, they make money, they lose money, you know, they're yeah. out there, they're having a go. Yeah. So she is, when the opportunity in here comes, she says, yes, I'm going, Yeah. you know? And then she has mixed experiences with raising the money, but that's, that's her character. Behind her sits Eric. Yeah. Eric is a more methodical, analytical, a saver. Yeah. So Cautious. when the opportunity cautious you yeah. know sensible mm -hmm. when the opportunity arises he, he makes the plan right i'll do this i'll save this way i'll do this you know i'll set this goal I'll, right. by this date and all the rest of it mm -hmm. so each money personality has strengths and weaknesses right. of right. course so where tony's strength is her risk-taking and her adventurousness mm -hmm. and she'll have new experience, experiences but she can also be a bit bossy and a bit losing money you know mm -hmm. in the process mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so his strength is the saving yeah and the methodical approach mm -hmm. but he can also have that uh, paralysis by analysis right you know, he won't take a risk yeah. he's too much yeah. think you Not know like yeah, yeah that's right so he, each person by nature of their um their strength we mm -hmm. also know what their learning journey is what mm -hmm. they need to experience so that mm -hmm. he has to go on a journey to take some risks in mm -hmm. the book you know mm -hmm. now brooke is mm -hmm. this girl here she's dropped her purse this right. is significant mm -hmm. because brooke's character Mm -hmm. She likes to keep up with the Joneses, oh. you know, she likes to, she has a fear of missing out, you know, oh. she wants to always do what everyone else is doing, what her friends are doing. And so she lives beyond her means. Right. 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 So she is, she kind of assumes that her parents will pay for her to go because it never occurs to her to manage her yeah. money well enough for her to go. You know? yeah. So that's the journey she's on. And then there's Jackson and he's sitting here Lee, with his arms out like this in gratitude and amazement that he is here on this yeah. elephant in India yeah. <laughs> because he's from a family that just works really hard and never seems to be able to get ahead. Right. You know, and they fall for the occasional get rich quick scheme and things like that because they really want to break through and they just right. struggle. Right. So that's his journey. And so he has a very interesting experience in India where of all four of them, he is approached by a young Indian man to do a business together ah so there's all sorts of you see these different characters mm -hmm. and these different mm -hmm. um challenges and learning journeys and so forth did you have to talk to teenagers around here uh when you wrote this book because i understand that you know there are children here who go and go on such journeys and they, they go through this um uh, I don't want to call it ordeal, but yeah, they do go through this thing where they have to manage their finance. I've, yes. I've actually personally come across uh, children who've gone gone on trips to India and uh, come back with you know stories, especially when when there was demonetization happening in India and mm. how they had to deal with it. And uh, right, yeah. Well, I, yes, I did speak to some students right. who were doing that sort of journey. I didn't find anyone who had was going to <laughs> India and been to India, but Cambodia and Thailand or I um, right. can't remember now exactly where, but I did speak to a few people. Mm -hmm. Nepal, I think one group had been to, you know, like I did do a bit of research. And, mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think it's a wonderful thing schools are doing with taking students on these adventures. Mm -hmm. So when you choose India as a destination, uh, I understand uh, you can look at the vast uh, cultural diversity and probably the disconnect that th these children would have to that country. But apart from that, would you also have thought about the, uh, the, the vast diversity in the Indian um, economical background? Yes, no, definitely. It was it was both those things. So it was right. the difference between life in Australia or a Western country and a country like India yeah. culturally, but also the vast extremes. So they're seeing the slums and they're yes. seeing these extraordinary ornate palaces right. and tombs and, you know, all the forts and all yeah. these extraordinary places as mm -hmm. they go. Did it. you try to balance the yin and yang somewhere in this book? Yes. <laughs> Yes, that's exactly the balance. <laughs> and and you know, I was trying to be really fair mm -hmm. 
honest and fair so that I could represent these teenagers with what they would genuinely experience when they come to so much difference and strangeness to them and and where they would have their own biases you know because they've come from things being done a certain way so some things would seem wrong mm -hmm. or strange you mm -hmm. know to them mm -hmm. but I also wanted them to flip it a little bit and see right. well, why does do they do it that way and why does that make sense so in one chapter of the books of the book mm -hmm. they go on homestay uh -huh. so the four students stay with a different kind of family um, you know yeah. so one stays with actually royalty Ooh. you know and one stays with in the the bishnoi you know right. so a very rural very yeah. basic right. and one stands with a suburban sort of family you know so they have yeah. these different experiences and then after the homestay all the students come together to discuss their experiences mm -hmm. and they're comparing the home life and the schooling and all this and so they have because they're 15 years old they have right. they have their own biases and prejudices and blind spots and all that but there's also insights like Brooke has a single mother uh -huh. and so she notices how much her mother is alone and struggles as a single mother whereas she lived with a was in a family was a single mother but there's also the relatives uh, you yeah, know it's extended yeah. family as well you know mm -hmm. there was this there's more support right you know so right. there's they, they're looking at all of this the other thing is in terms of the book itself mm -hmm. all the way through there are at the end of a the chapter there are questions for reflection right for thought right. so that when something wasn't tackled in the in the story itself I could draw out a question about it and say what about this think about this how right. do you deal with this right. what would you do if you were presented with that situation for example beggars how would you respond to the beggars you know because they're confronted by that you know and all those different that is sorts so beautiful, of experiences. Lillian, because uh, see, that's that's what we need at the end of the day: thought-provoking uh, writing. And uh, in case you know, in case someone just reads through you, you're still extending that. You're just throwing the question at them, and mm. that will definitely get someone thinking. And uh, I hope so. You know, because my intention was: look, they can jump those bits. They can just read it as a yes. story if they want to. Yeah. Or, the or they can ponder upon it for some time, book, yeah. you know, in, in school, yes. which is how Camilla is using it now. Mm. She's actually now in Sweden mm -hmm. and she is door knocking schools in Sweden. They want to get this book into oh. every school through Sweden and Europe. It's beautiful. And I want to do the same here. <laughs> so any teachers, <laughs> contact me. That yeah. would be lovely. And um, the other thing is, um, pardon my ignorance, but uh, you told about the four uh, financial personalities. Uh, uh, do we, can you actually say that all these four personalities can be within the same person? Well, this is an interesting one. This personality, I'm not a personality expert. So mm. anything I say, you know, take this some salt. No, no, no. Let's, let's but, take it from your perspective. But, like, what yeah, do you think? I here? think, look, I do think mm -hmm. there is one philosophy that I subscribe to that we each have every human trait absolutely in one form or another right and that's right. An, an, a kind of in a way isn't it an indian or hindu yes so that's exactly I why that. i ask you that question yes. yeah because I, so, I understand you follow that yes philosophy. i do <laughs> so i do yeah I agree with that idea so i do believe that we have each mm. one to some degree but we also have dominant you know predominant right. personalities right. we have certain ones that mm. are more more recognizably us mm -hmm. you know in the ayurvedic right. system of mm -hmm. health and mm -hmm. they have the the different vata and pitta and, uh, pitta and, kapha. and kapha and all this sort of yeah. thing and so they would say that each person has a predominant yeah dosha dosha yeah. yes so i think it's like that yeah yeah interesting mm -hmm. um well, back to, uh, because you, you just spoke about Ayurveda and um, yeah, the, the doshas, let's talk about your lifestyle. I understand that uh, you've uh, followed a very simplistic lifestyle and uh, want, want to you know, live a fuller, fuller life. Tell us uh, more about it. Well, I have always been someone who, who is a great believer in whole foods, sim you know, plant foods, simple sodas. I've been mostly vegetarian for most of my life. And... Um, I don't believe in the really processed refined foods so so simple life in that sense you know and to be connected to the earth right. where i live we have huge windows looking onto trees right. i love trees and nature you know i go out with the dogs every day mm -hmm. most days maybe not today it's pouring with rain but <laughs> you know for a walk to be connected yeah. to earth relationships so important i don't i've never been big for 
what um, screen and technology and all that, but I tend to, you know, marry people who are, you know, yeah. like my I think to, my life to balance life. both, both yes, that's it's right. best to get that's married right. to someone who's technologically. That's right. It's, it's been a blessing in you, my you're life. You're speaking my heart, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I follow your language. Yes, go yes, ahead. <laughs> yes, and something we've discovered we have in common is dance. Dance, dance yes, yes. yes uh, so I love to dance. That's my, my, my first love after my children, you know, like family and, and writing mm -hmm. is, is dance. Is dancing, yes. yeah. Um, so when you say a simple life, does that is that what you mean? Uh, I think to the rest of the world that's a simple life. For me, that's that's the best kind of life anyone can have. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> can ask for, in fact. <laughs> yeah, they do. Don't they say you know if you were on your deathbed, right? What would be your regrets? What would you have wanted to do right. differently? Yeah. And when I look back at my life, you know, so often what people say is, well, I would say thank you, I love you to the people closest to me. Mm -hmm. That's important to me is Absolutely. to make sure my immediate relationships yeah. are loving and close and right. respectful and right. that there's very honest communication and things like that. So, yeah, those yeah. values. Yeah, guess, you don't so. you don't leave any of those chapters unread or, you know, un, uh, not yeah. finished. Um, I do my best. Absolutely. You know, to, we try to do that. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Coming back to relationships, um, you have written yet another book, um, yes. Wanted the Greener, greener Grass. Greener Wanted grass. Greener Grass, um, yes. Well, that, um, that was a very striking title because uh, for some time as I was browsing through your uh, web page, uh, website uh, and I saw this thing that said Wanted Greener Grass and I was like, uh, okay, is this something that uh, sh uh, that's coming out as a book or is it that you know there's something that is gonna happen and you know is, is it is it like an advertisement for something for some time I was uh, quizzed about it and then I realized this is this uh, very precious book on relationships yes yes uh, tell yes. us about it yes all right so wanted greener grass is a novel about a woman a couple whose relationship is a little flat mm -hmm. it's not it's a bit rock it's not really working they're not fulfilled mm -hmm. you know and the main character is a woman called Mia mm -hmm. and her husband John is an accountant mm -hmm. and the book begins when her fa her husband hears that his father is has had a stroke he's dying you know so he flies to London to mm -hmm. see his father and Mia stays home here mm -hmm. in Australia you know and she thinks when he comes back I'm gonna say let's call let's it off it. It's not mm -hmm. really working anymore, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. while he's in England, he discovers things about his father, and he has some wake-up moments that make him realize that he wants to do his life differently. And so he contacts her and says, "I'm coming back different. I'm I'm quitting, resigning from my job. Come back. I'm going to be a gardener." He's like complete change, you Ooh, know. Okay. I'm going to do everything differently. And so I'm she going has to, be... to wait. So she, so she thinks, okay, I won't, I won't call it off. I'll wait and see. Yeah. So he comes back, and when he's back, he's different. Right. He is different. He's committed. He's right. making the relationship more important again. Right. You know. Mm -hmm. And so she's really, really happy. It's like she's an in love again, and, and, you know. <laughs> so the wanted greener grass is this idea that, you know. She was looking else, you know, starting to look Absolutely. elsewhere, thinking, you know, mm -hmm. my life isn't fulfilling. Yeah. Then he comes back and everything looks better until she realizes something. And there is, I can't tell you because it will, right. it will spoil the story. Yeah. The reader has to read, you know, the, read the story. But she has some realizations. And this book was very inspired by another philosophical thing, which is in a way philosophical, but the concept of the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there is some... Um, um, a gentleman called Joseph Campbell mm -hmm. and he was one of the most famous one of the greatest mythologists of the world he studied myths and legends around the world and he discovered that in every culture there's a common story which is the hero's journey right. and that is that of a character who would leave home leave the familiar right. and go on an adventure and overcome big challenges and fight dragons and you know whatever right. and yeah. then come back home with the nectar, the golden nectar, you know, the what is right. learned. Right. But this is a metaphor, you know, for each of us in our lives, the challenges that we tackle and the fears we overcome and the journeys, you know, that we, the, the new experiences that, and the skills we have to develop, that we go from our normal life and we ch tackle these things and then we come back expanded, enriched, 
That is know? a fascinating to actually yeah. connect that one single thread line which talks about the hero and the many challenges of fighting demons and dragons and yes. not and coming yeah. back. Yeah, that's, so that's me that's again with that thing, thing about yeah, the fantasy exactly. thing into reality. reality. So how do we apply this idea? It's, it's like fighting into... the, your own yeah. demons. Like you're thinking, you know, that's a fight within yourself as, as well. It mm. is because sometimes our challenges are external, right? You know, and a, a challenge with another person, or whatever. And sometimes it's internal. It's bad habits or fears or whatever. Mm. So in the book, mm -hmm. Mia and John, her husband John, are on a hero's journey of their relationship. And also, she's frustrated. I'm pointing to the wrong book. And oh, she's okay. frustrated with mm -hmm. the fact that she doesn't um, like her job. Mm -hmm. So she's on a hero's journey. And she's envious of her friend Cheryl, who has a, a, a you know a more fulfilling life work-wise. You know, so she's on this hero's journey to make her own life more fulfilling. And so this is therefore something that becomes the 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 hero's journey for Mia, and then for her husband John as they tackle you know their expectations and their fantasies and their you know like to to resolve these challenges yeah beautiful um well lillian so we have uh, known lillian as uh, lillian the writer the author uh yes. tell us more about lillian the uh, orator the uh, motivational speaker the speaker <laughs> <laughs> all right well again this is something that i love to do mm -hmm. and where it began was many many years ago when i was 24 mm -hmm. And I was involved in a personal development program for teenagers. So you see the connection already. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And there was a woman in the audience called Stephanie Burns, uh, not in the audience, sorry, one of the trainers, the head right. trainer was a woman called Stephanie Burns. Mm -hmm. And I was sitting watching her mm -hmm. and she was talking about, she was one of these really brilliant, amazing people. And at 18, she was lecturing at, at NASA, you wow. know, like that kind of thing. And she was offered this opportunity to give a talk. And she didn't have the knowledge of the topic, but she accepted the talk. And I remember thinking, really, what? And she got up there on stage and, and she managed the audience in answering their own questions. And it was a wake up moment for me because I had been wanting to teach my writing classes, creative writing classes, and right. I didn't feel good enough, confident enough, whatever. And when she did that, I remember sitting there looking up at her and thinking, so you don't have to be perfect before you start, you know? So I got out there and I started to teach creative writing, which put me in front of groups. And I discovered that I loved it. I loved empowering people and helping people to become more confident and, and so forth. And so then once the Mastery Club book came out, I had opportunities to go and speak about the book. And so I would speak about living your dreams. You know, beautiful. So you were room. always a writer first and a yes, speaker. That's uh, right. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Thanks so to your writing. Yeah. Writer, then teacher, then speaker. Mm -hmm. Yes. And mm -hmm. workshop leader, you know. And now, yeah, I love that to go and speak to a group of people and share empowering ideas. Who, are, you, who are your usual audience? Are they teenagers or are they... Uh, Sometimes I've spoken to school groups and because I developed a 10-week program based on the 10 lessons in the Mastery Club. Ah. So I've taken that into schools. Right. Yeah. And so that's a program. And in fact, that program has been taught here and in England, Scotland, America, Bali, you know, you know, because yeah, it's a great program, but also speaking to adults, to groups mm -hmm. of women, to mixed groups, often it's groups of women. Yes. I have I've noticed that mm -hmm. your, your topics are usually based on empowerment. Uh, what, what do you think about, um, uh, empowering women and, uh, 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 we're not getting into a feminist talk here, but, um, uh, I'd like to know your views on it. Well, I think it's, it's critical that, look, do you know what? One of my mentors and inspirations is a man called Dr. John Demartini. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And he is someone who's inspired a lot of my work and he actually wrote the forward for the Mastery Club and so forth. One thing he says is that, kind of like our life purpose, he says there are seven areas in mm -hmm. life. Mm -hmm. All right, we've got spirituality, right? mental, mm -hmm. um, strength and clarity and so forth and wisdom mm -hmm. physical strength and beauty mm -hmm. we have the family mm -hmm. we have our social community mm -hmm. we have our vocation mm -hmm. and we have our finances so it's mm -hmm. seven areas of i life. think i can connect connected to uh, principles of yoga again <laughs> yes yes i'm sure it is i'm yes, sure it is yes. so those seven areas mm -hmm. he says our life purpose in a sense mm -hmm. is to achieve 
maximum empowerment of all seven areas right. of life. Mm -hmm. And so, and that way we create a holistic and a, a very well-rounded mm -hmm. person. So for women, I think that's true as well. And he says, for example, in the countries where there are dictators, dictators occur when the people are disempowered. Right. When the people are empowered, they don't stand for the, the dictator, mm -hmm. you know. So it's, it's like a, a, a dovetailing of, of a pattern right. in a sense. Right. So for women, I think our, our responsibility right. is to empower ourselves in all seven areas. Mm -hmm. as much as we're able mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and then i guess i connect with women because women are mothers and a lot of my right. writing is for children and teenagers right you know so and women often make a lot of decisions in a household yeah. in terms of the values that and as mothers i think they're also teachers and kids. and they're teachers yeah. yeah so it's such a great thing to connect with women mm -hmm. and empower them in empowering their families Lily and I passed upon something that said, let's bully on purpose um, uh, in, schools. in schools. Yes, um, you saw that on my website. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, what is that so all what about? Is that all about? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that was driven to some degree by this work I've done with Dr. John D. Martini mm -hmm. and a book that I read called The Dance of Bullying by a Canadian psychologist called Ken Pierce. Mm -hmm. And Alice Bailey, I can't remember now the surname of the woman who was his co-author. And Ken Pierce studied with Dean Martini as well, Dr. Right. Dean Martini as well. So what they're saying is mm -hmm. that bullying is a, is really not something we will ever eradicate. It's right. not something we'll get rid of. It's here as part of the evolutionary journey, journey and it serves us as human beings. Mm -hmm. And so we should learn from it and work with it. Mm -hmm. as a dynamic and I'll explain that more in a moment but the let's bully on purpose in schools is my concept to take this as a program into schools right to educate teachers and children and their parents mm -hmm. so that some of the principles the ideas here is one that we will never eradicate bullying because it is serving us because we learn through conflict absolutely yeah mm -hmm. it's, it's profound it's deep uh, yes <laughs> It's not nice. And it could be controversial. It, that's right. It can be controversial. And it's not nice, shall we say. But it's in this yin-yang, this chaos and uh, order. This... At the end of it, uh, Lily and I totally connect to it because I understand that uh, the, this balance is very mm. important. And mm. but to an extent, like how we say in yoga that you know, you know stress is essential to yes. actually de-stress. Yes. This sort of a, you know, understanding or conflict is essential yes. to actually create better relations yes. get better. exactly mm -hmm. so this course that i've developed draws upon all these universal laws and principles mm -hmm. so just as i was saying before we wouldn't go to the top of the roof right and just step off and say well i'm a good person i'll be fine because right. it doesn't matter how good we are is the law of gravity it's absolute it applies to all of us so the law of polarity is that right. no experience is one-sided so we can never just have peace and niceness we also have to have conflict and difficulty because it delivers us part of the lessons yes. we need. You know, we don't walk with our left foot, oh, sorry, our right foot and then our wrong foot. We walk, right. you know, right foot, right and the left, left foot. You yes. know what I mean? Like, it, it, it's this, it's a balance. I, I like us. the way you think about it and you put it up. Yeah. <laughs> well, a lot of these things I've heard elsewhere, which is right. my, my mission, my life mission, to take empowering ideas I've heard, share them through story. You know, that's my, my thing. So one of the ideas that I really understood well from Ken Pierce's book was that people have kind of um, an emotional charge. If we're very full of ourselves and cocky, mm -hmm. you might say we've got a very big positive charge. If we're very unconfident and shy and not, you know, like poor self-esteem, mm -hmm. we have a negative charge. Right. So because of the laws of physics, the positive and negative are drawn together. Right. And they're drawn together to to their opposites are attracted to cancel out the charge so that the person who is cocky is humbled and the person who is too meek Achai. is strengthened yeah. more yeah. confident you know it doesn't always happen quickly and easily it can take quite a few clashes right and it might not happen at all but that's actually like the divine purpose of this attraction of opposites mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so i believe that the that what we need in schools is for communication and conflict resolution skills to be taught in schools 
as an essential part, a mandatory part of the curriculum right. from prep to right. year 12, three or four, whatever times a week, as often as English and mathematics and all this are taught today. So very essential in fact. Mm. Because all of us have to deal with relationships with people, Absolutely. whereas not all of us are going to become scientists or you know, geography, you know, geologists or, or yeah. whatever, you know, but whatever comes out of academics. Yeah. And That's the end right. of the day, relationships matter. That's right. <laughs> so primary should yeah. be life skills, which in fact is goal setting, as I've taught in the Master Club, financial literacy, as I've taught in Quest Spirituals, communication skills, as I would like to teach through mm -hmm. the bullying program, you know Careful. what I mean? So those life skills, then on top of that, we have a solid base for building other skills, other knowledge. You know, like to me, that's common sense. Wow, lovely, Lilina, mm. what you're doing through your writing, you know, uh, taking your personal uh, life goals and, you know, setting it up as examples and creating um, fictional stories on reality, uh, real circumstances, uh, bringing in so much of uh, wealth of uh, knowledge uh, through your writing. I'm, I'm certain that this journey would just keep going on and um, keep on inspiring a lot of people world around. Thank you. <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lillian, for spending this yeah, beautiful uh, time with us. Thank you for having me. Uh, <laughs> I want to thank you and your team um, for responding to my inquiry. I'm, I'm very touched and appreciative. Thank you. We wish you all the very best. Thank you so much. Thank you.